They were all laughing at me. They are transphobic if you think that is wrong. Where are you on something like bathrooms, for example, and bathrooms? Jesus. We're really doing it. Do you it, want huh? like a genitalia check or what are you what are you looking for? I, I think the that only that obvious answer to bathroom stuff. The reason I called the position ridiculous or I think the word was <laughs> But I, yeah, I think wow. the reason I said that was because it was the it was the should statement because okay. I don't really know how you could advocate for this position of like um, which basically necessitates uh, either ethnically cleansing or genociding like millions of people. Dennis, welcome. It's it's great to speak to you today. Well, thank you for having me. Just to start, and this can be so quick and then we move on, just as a sort of sanity check, I've started to ask guests in this year, last year, the following question. Is there any way to accurately say that Donald Trump won the 2020 election? Just a simple answer if there is <laughs> oh, one and no. not. If there is one oh, and no. if not, it's fine for you to explain. So I, ha I, have, I have a relatively simple answer. Relatively. And I've given it from oh, boy. the election day to this day. Yes, sir. I am agnostic, which has satisfied neither the left nor the right. Okay. My, my colleagues on the right want me to say it was stolen. Mm -hmm. And people on the left want me to say we are certain it wasn't stolen. Well, and half of the right also wants you to say that, right? Half of the right wants me to, oh, that, I wouldn't say half, half. I, I would say most people on the right believe it was stolen or- Prager is correct with respect to the polling data. Or, or that there was a good chance it was. Wow. Uh, Unfortunately. I don't know what that gains us, but it, it, it's fair that you ask. See, it's funny. Can, uh, you regard that as a sanity check. I do. So, okay, so let me offer my sanity check. Please. Do you believe that men who say they're women can compete with women in women's sports. I couldn't have made a better movie. Actually, if this was a movie, I would be reviewing it and I would be saying, this movie is kind of shit because I feel like they're too blunt with the political messaging. Like it was too on the nose. They should have been more subtle. The idea that somebody could say, Let's do a sanity check and then ask a question that is currently at the center of our democracy and is a conspiracy that 70% of people on the conservative party believe in. That somebody could go from that and go, okay, fine. But do you believe in X social issue that impacts less than 1% of all people in the country and then athletics in 1%, so like 1% of the 1%. And they think that that's somehow like a valid counter question that it somehow shows that there's an equal amount of insanity on the left or right. And it's like the perfect microcosm. That is the perfect microcosm of where we're at politically right now in the United States. Holy Christ. Nerds think 1% of people play sports? I'm sorry, what are the percentages of people in NCAA sports? What do you think it is? Percentage of college students in NCAA sport, maybe two or two to five percent. Four hundred eighty thousand compete as NCAA athletes. Five hundred twenty thousand. Okay, how many kids in college? Fourteen point two million. So one point four million would be one. Uh, would be ten percent. One hundred forty thousand would be one percent. So about two and a half percent. I think in a lot of sports, that does not make sense. So how do you... Was that the answer you expected? Because you did a little bit of a look to the side there. Did you think I no, was going to... No, I didn't look to the side because I took off my earphones. Understood, sir. I didn't. I realized that I don't need them. Okay. Um, but this is a so... different topic, Dennis. I'm sorry. It's a different topic. Did do we want to close on the election first? Oh, well, you said you would just wanted to ask that question for a sanity check. Okay, okay. and you're agnostic I mean, is the answer. Yeah, yeah. So you I am agnostic because so many things happened that are uh, that are that were odd or unique. Mm. Uh, like it was the first time that a president had. Pacman ever... didn't address the fallacious comparison. Well. The comparison isn't really fallacious. It wasn't it wasn't a fallacy. It wasn't It's not even necessarily a bad comparison. They can both work as sanity checks. 
I just think it's funny that the sanity check here on the left is something that is, I would consider it a very niche social issue. Trans sports, I think is quite a niche social issue. So it's just funny that he went to that rather than like, if we're trying to stay within the same realm of like gravity of comparisons, I would at least say maybe um, how many how many progressives think that the election was stolen from Bernie Sanders, maybe, or at the very least, you could do the how many uh, how many on the left think that uh, Russia Gate was real. These are at least like impacting kind of large numbers of people and is like kind of in the same domain or ballpark at least. But to instantly run to the um, to instantly run to the trans sports thing is just hilarious. Uh, an incumbent president had ever gotten more votes than he did in his first election and lost. Uh, that uh, all the all the swing states went in his favor. That 17 of the 18 counties that are considered bellwether counties went in his favor. We, those who think something bad happened, yeah. are not out of their minds. Okay, I mean, we don't have to make this the subject of the conversation, but things sometimes happen for the first time. I guess the question I would ask as a follow-up would be: Did you see compelling evidence? from any one state that suggests that Joe Biden lost it even though he was given the win? Is there a single state where you feel confident yeah. it was stolen? Georgia, Georgia might be one of them. Uh, Pennsylvania might be one. Uh, and, and of course, people say, because I, I, I love to have people I differ with on my show. Oh, yeah. And so I, I, and I read the left. I only wish the left read the right as much as I read the left. Well, I try uh, to, but what evidence was there in Georgia? Do, you probably do. I, th I think I think if, if you do, you're you're atypical. Uh, but but in, it, in 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 any event, yeah. What's the uh, Georgia I'm evidence? All the time Georgia that courts dismissed the, the all these cases. That's true, uh, but that's the tragedy. See, if I were an America loving Democrat, and there are eleven America loving Democrats, and there are America hating Democrats, there are both. But there are America-loving Democrats. If I were one, yeah, I would say, please, let this let go to us court. Air all of these complaints. Yeah, let us have some type, as close as we can, to some neutral authority. Not rule on it. Just allow the American public to hear what evidence there might be. And I'll add another thing. If one believes, and I'd love you to respond to this. Yeah. If one believes that Donald Trump is a a neo-Nazi fascist, something I've never said, but you, we could okay, maybe find but, someone but who it, believes that. Yeah. Well, well, okay. I believe you haven't said it, but it's neo, do you need to be a? I don't think Trump is a neo-Nazi. <clears throat> again, something I've said over and over again. Chances are, if you're over forty in the United States of America and you've had any participation in politics whatsoever, you probably love Jewish people. Jews have, for the longest time in the United States, Jews have enjoyed very, very, very widespread support from both political parties. It's not germane to my okay. to my argument, whether yeah. you said it or not. It's said often that he is a fascist. <coughs> Excuse me. That he is a fascist is constantly said uh, on the left. He is. And, and so... Uh, if you believe that, mm -hmm. aren't you morally bound to cheat on his behalf? For example, if I were in Germany in 1932 during the elections that brought Hitler to power, I tell you, I would have cheated mm. on behalf uh, of any other party uh, than, than Hitler's party. Yeah. Aren't you morally bound to cheat if you believe the man <laughs> is a fascist? You'd have to ask. That's an interesting question. Um... Well, ah, I'm not sure. That is an interesting question. Someone who believes that, I don't know. I mean, it's, I think, listen, we only have a half hour and we're five minutes yeah, so in. Yeah, so look, well, let's talk I, about I think a, what I, I would say is the audience can judge. Is there evidence out of Georgia that's convincing to them? Is your answer to did Trump win logical into them in any way? Let's let the audience decide on this section of the conversation. Bear. I'm really interested in talking to you about woke, anti-woke, cultural issues, et cetera. Now, you and I could pick one thing, like cat litter boxes in bathrooms or 
quote men and women's sports or drag Be for anti-democratic action against groups which reject democracy themselves um i mean principally you shouldn't be but there's an interesting question of like here here's an interesting question in a democratic society i it's this is kind of a um it's an expanding upon of the question of can a man sell himself into slavery in a truly free society should you be able to do that and there's, you know, there's interesting ones on both sides. Like, well, I mean, you're free to do whatever you want, but are you free to sell your freedom? Is it freedom to be able to sell your freedom? I don't know. That's a, I, I don't know what the answer is to that. Um, I don't know what the answer is to that. So someone in chat said, the answer is no, you don't cheat. Hitler came to power by subverting democratic processes. If you do it too, you are just as bad. I don't know if that's true. My understanding is the Enabling Act did pass in, in their legislative body. So if somebody tries to pass legislation, that is anti-democratic. Is it anti-democratic to oppose the democratic process when the democratic process leads you to anti-democratic measures? I don't know what the answer is to that. I haven't spent much time thinking about it, but I've had the, the closest I've had to this question being posed to me before um, was Pisco um, when we talked about a coup and I said, I, originally my answer was, it's, it can't be a coup if they're following established processes. And then Pisco brought up the question of like, well, could we fathom that perhaps a coup could be done following established processes. Say, for instance, um, in in uh, in Congress or in some other thing, you know, somebody rules that we're going to ignore the outcome of the election and two thirds of Congress will vote on it. Um, would that would we consider that a coup if like every process, if every established process was followed? Um, could we could we imagine like a legal coup? I don't know the answer to this. I'm not sure. Maybe. I feel like I feel like I could imagine that. So then the question, or a similar thing, I guess from the left, for my question would be like something like packing the courts, right? Would could packing the courts be seen as um, as an example of a democratic anti-democratic thing? Could could that could one see that as that shows or whatever? And we could just talk about that for twenty five minutes. But I want to zoom out a little bit because you've been in this for a while, and I've been following many of the things you've said about these issues. Here's my curiosity. If you look at polling. Do Americans not learn about this stuff in history? This is literally how the Nazis came to power. Do Americans not learn what stuff? If you're gonna just reject polling, then we'll talk about that. But let's assume that we have some polling that tells us something that is relatively close to what the country believes. Record support for same-sex marriage today. Record number of people saying, I'm moving away from religion. Highest in the Roe v. Wade era, of the country says abortion should be legal in most cases. Using Hitler is morally loading it because Nazis and genocide and whatnot. It's probably a more interesting and accurate person to ask, would you cheat against Mussolini? Okay, I'm gonna be totally honest. I don't know f all about Mussolini. What the fuck did he, did he, was he the only fascist loser that didn't actually genocide anybody? Or what the fuck, what was he doing? What, we hear so much about even Japan and Hitler. What the f was Mussolini doing the whole time? Was he like the loser fascist that He was a failure. He helped Germany with the Jews. He's like Rolo to the red pill. <laughs> Some might call me the godfather of fascism. 60% says we haven't gone far enough on democracy. Making trans people feel anyway. welcome. Okay, I Especially when it's run by a morally corrupt, self interested populace. Wow. Isn't there like a founding father's quote or something about how democracy only works as long as your people aren't... I feel like there's a, a fucking Jefferson quote. This or also shit. sounds like you tolerate intolerance. Yeah, a little bit. It's it's a similar type of paradox, yeah. Basically, there are like the... the, the in, in the most general sense, we have virtues that we use that we want to protect. And these virtues basically allow us to... Uh, interact with a whole bunch of different people. But what do you do when you get somebody that wants to engage with these virtues in a way that's contra, um, contraindicatory? Is that a word? That, that is um, contradictory. Contraindicatory. Contradictory <laughs> um, to like the values that those virtues espouse, right? That's like the, the challenge, right? Do you believe democracy to be an inherently moral system of governance? My answer would be no. The moral fighting always happens through its mechanisms by Prager's logic. Both parties should always cheat as long as you believe your party is morally superior, no? Um, hmm, it depends. It's really hard to bake normativity or moral questions into, into forms of government. Like, 
I don't know if I would load. I think I, I might treat governments the same way that I treat um, economic systems. I don't know if I would say that one is inherently moral or not. Right? Like, would, um, whoops. Like, let's say we have, hypothetically, a democracy that allows for slavery. And then let's say you have an authoritarian dictatorship that, you know, demands equal treatment of its citizens. Like, is, is one considered, like, is the democracy a more moral system of governance that just happens to be effecting, like, more immoral outcomes? Or do we remove the normativity completely from the, I don't know. I don't, I don't know the answer. I'm not sure. I, I, I lean towards systems of governance themselves are morally neutral. They don't, you wouldn't say a, a particular way of governing is, is good or bad. You could, I'm sure you could make trends, like some forms of um, governance tend to produce certain outcomes that tend to be moral or immoral. Like that. Yeah. I could go on, but you get the gist of what I'm saying. Do you feel as though this is a lost cause and the country has clearly gone in a different direction from where you would like to see it? Or what do you think might happen that would turn around this 30, 40 year trend of moving to the left culturally that I believe we are seeing in the polls? There's no question we're moving uh, to, the, to the left culturally. Uh, uh, the first thing people have to do is recognize reality. Uh, you, you may not, you may or may not be happy with it. It, it, just just parenthetically, I just did an hour of radio because uh, I do a lot of hours that are not politics. And, sure. I, and it was about a subject because I'm writing a commentary on the Bible and I'm, I'm finishing volume four in, in which I discuss in, on one verse, is there luck in life or is everything God's will? I, I'm a, a deep believer in God. And of course, I believe there's bad luck because that's reality. It, it, if you get a kidney stone, and I use that example, I don't believe God placed the kidney stone in your kidney. Hmm. I, I believe that it was your crappy luck that you got a kidney stone. But, but a lot let of me let me just dig it, not to interrupt, but I want to make sure we know what we what you mean by luck. Do you mean by let's imagine the prevalence of kidney stones is two percent, just for hypothetical for our conversation. God created a world in which there's a 2% prevalence of kidney stones. You had the bad luck to be in the 2%. Is that what you're correct. saying? That's correct. That's okay. What I'm now, why did God create the kidney stones to begin with? Because God, God did not create uh, a perfect nature. I mean, a trees can fall. Well, I, my, I should reread the Bible. That should be the book I read because my, my biblical scholarship is so bad compared to what it ought to be probably for someone that went to four years of Jesuit school. Um, that's an, that's a, that, that statement hits my ear in a very strange way. God didn't create perfect nature. That's very, that's an interesting, I don't know if it's wrong. It, it sounds wrong. It sounds very wrong to me, but. Did not create uh, a perfect nature. I mean, f trees can fall, avalanches can happen. Okay. Uh, it is our task to fight cancer and and to and to be able to live with avalanches. Got I, it. I, I I don't I I would uh, the human being wanted to leave the Garden of Eden. That's my that's my take on the story. We rather live in a free universe than in a perfect universe. Okay. Okay. So so but I'm I'm glad you you went to theology with me. Anyway, I'm the only reason I raised this is it because of God's image line? Well, the only thing created in God's image, I believe, is man, and then women were like a subset of that losers. <clears throat> but I um, I mean, like trees falling at avalanches is part of like it's part of the circle of life. It's part of nature. It's hard to say that that's like not perfect or or, or, or imperfect. I don't know. It's just a, it's a very strange thing. I, but I mean, I could be wrong. I don't know. I'm not, like I said, my biblical scholarship is not like A++ or whatever. So if he's like doing studies, maybe he knows more. But um, my understanding is that like all the imperfections and faults that exist in humans are basically uh, once we once we ate from the forbidden tree and we gained the knowledge, right? The um, uh, was it Sisyphus that, that took fire from the gods and gave it to humans? It's essentially that story. Um, that from that point on, all the pains and, and trials and tribulations that humans suffer in life is basically a result of them turning their backs on God, more or less. Uh, that's why I understand it. I, mean, I could be wrong, but so when, when you say like, you know, I think it's the function of the courts, Leos, and constitution to remediate or prevent loss of individual rights. Okay. When you say like, what, whence the evil come in, in society, it's, it comes from, um, from, from man turning their back on God, basically. And then that's where it all comes from. 
Because I don't believe there was like disease it's or sickness or hunger in the Garden of Eden, markets. right? that will tend to monopolies with incentives that promote human needs. Democracy similarly distributes rights akin to wealth and capitalism, but you need guardrails to keep people in the processes. Oh, he's Jewish? Oh, I don't know anything about Jews. I have no idea what they believe in. is I am not happy to acknowledge the power of bad luck or good luck, but it is the reality. I am not happy that 40, uh, that 45% of, uh, of young Americans say, uh, according to Pew, uh, that uh, they believe in Jewish, free speech, but not Christian. for hate speech. Gotcha. A, it shows you how incoherent young people's thinking is that they don't understand that the whole point of free speech is to allow speech that you can't stand. Okay, I'm a Jew. If you don't think the Holocaust happened, you're a liar, you are sick, you are perverted, but you are allowed to say it. By the way, you're not allowed in most European countries. You can be in prison for denying the Holocaust. Yeah, and to be clear, I'm a Jew as well, and I believe exactly what you just said. I believe you. Okay. I, I had a feeling you would, but, uh, but just know your side is as opposed to free speech as more opposed than Hitler. ever any segment of Americans has ever been. Oh, okay. mm. we, we are living through the greatest crisis of free speech in American history. That poll is an example. Here's another one. 25% okay. of Americans aged 40 and over have never been married, as opposed to 8% in 1980. We went from 8 to 25% in 40 years. Can we talk about that one a little more? That one sure. I find interesting. I'm not 40, but I, I, I'm in a long-term relationship. I have a baby. I'm not oh, married. Oh, Blazer420 Daddy, thanks for something. Married. It's a conscious decision I've made evaluating what is marriage. Wait, did he say he's not married? Went from eight to 25% in 40 years. Can we talk about that one a little more? That one sure. I find interesting. I'm not 40, but I, I, I'm in a long-term relationship. I have a baby. I'm not married. It's a conscious decision. That's I, very interesting. Huh. I've made evaluating what is marriage in 2023. Is that the sort of contract I'm interested in? Do I need that to mediate my relationship with my girlfriend? Are there protections that I find necessary? I, I don't know that for me and for so many other people I know that are probably in the group you're sort of describing here. I, in my opinion, especially once children are present, um, I think marriage is an important safeguard for the woman. Because if, you're, if you have a baby with a guy and you're not married and that relationship fails, uh, you could be in a very, very, very tough spot where you've thrown away your career, you've thrown away your future, and now you have no safeguards or protections, and you're looking at, yeah, that's a, now he might be in a common law marriage state, or they have another contract worked out, but that's a, that seems like a very scary position to be in as a, as a woman, I would say. I don't know that it's any kind of moral commentary or a commentary on the nature of relationships, but more about, for most of human history, this sort of contract didn't exist, there was a period where it peaked. I think it was the 50s or 60s or 70s. It, it seems to be in decline. It's sort of a blip. I don't know that it's that indicative of the, the, the broader point you're trying to make, Dennis. It's funny you should say this. Uh, I went to a wedding last Sunday night, and my wife just spoke to uh, the woman who got married. Yeah. And they had lived together for about four years. And she said, everything feels different. And I always explain to people, you use the word girlfriend. So you'll just have to take my word for it. Please. That you would be conveying a very different image of yourself and your relationship if you said my wife. I agree. Oh, okay. I, I think that that is a worthy commitment that human beings should make. I would like your, ch you have a child, I, I, I believe. Yes, indeed. I'd like a child to believe mommy and daddy are husband and wife. 
not just boyfriend and girlfriend. <laughs> it's better for the kid, better for you, and better for the world. But why do you think then that this marriage thing was the sort of more prevalent status for such a tiny blip in human history, well, and now it's that? already diminishing? Well, I mean, the Bible was written 3,000 years ago and everybody got married. I don't know why you call it a blip in history. It, it was, it, it's universal. People got married in virtually every civilization. Well, so if we consider modern humanity 250,000 years, for most of time, humans were not okay. getting married. All right, look, if I can't talk about you know, pre-Stone Age or, or pre, pre, excuse me, pre-Bronze uh, Age man. Okay, fair. Okay, since the Bronze Age, people have gotten married. <laughs> and, and you know what? We, we've Representative done better. form of government is the most morally metric, but that too marriage. only lasts as long as the majority respects sovereignty. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a hard one. If you've got an immoral population and then you've got a, like a more moral dictator, I just it feels hard to say, I can't believe I just dirtied my shit up like this, like an actual fucking retard. I can't believe I did this. Makes a better a better person and a better world. Yeah, what I see is commitment between two parents and probably a fair amount of economic stability are really the ideal circumstances. But I think I don't want to get away from your broader point, Dennis, which I think is you're recognizing the reality oh, of the I am. situation. And I'm fighting it. And you're fighting double, it. And I'm fighting it because I, I, I believe that uh, graduating high school, getting a job, and getting, a ma getting married, and getting married before you have a baby, that is almost the perfect mm. recipe for a better life. But going more broad on the other cultural war issues I mentioned, Wait. you're 75, oh. you've been at this for a while. Don't you think that maybe the, it's simply being lost? Or let me ask it in a different way. What catalyst do you think might happen that might turn this thing around so that the so-called kind of anti-woke side wins or resurges? Well, it's a great question, and I don't have a perfect answer. I do think that the uh, chaos of the trans movement, hmm. that people support the removal of girls' breasts when they're 18 or even sometimes younger, or boy, boys getting castrated because they say they're girls. This has alarmed a fair number of people, even on your side of the spectrum. Mm. They realize this is madness. We have gone out of our minds. And I, I, I know why we've gone out of our minds. I don't think you would, you would uh, agree with my uh, analysis, but it, it is- of in, God, Christianity. I could put it to you in one sentence. It is, uh, it is a quote attributed to G.K. Chesterton, but we can't verify he said it. I am only saying that because I didn't come up with this. Okay. When people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They believe in anything. Mm. And, and this trans movement is the proof. I said on Bill Maher's show four years ago, Yeah. right before uh, you saw that, it, it's gone viral. I saw it. <laughs> Uh, he said, "He said, oh, Trump lies. I said, it doesn't compare to the lies of the left. America is systemically racist and men menstruate. And he cracked up, the whole audience cracked up, and the whole panel cracked up. They were all laughing at me. And Bill Maher said, this is why it's gone viral. There are like 10 million views of, of this uh, yeah. particular scene. Where he says, Dennis, where'd you come up with that one? And that was 2019. Of the fall of 2019, and and people go, what are you nuts? Who says men menstruate? Within two years, if you deny men menstruate, you are considered transphobic. Well, listen, I mean, I'm glad to have. I don't. I'm going to be honest. I don't know that this is the most interesting thing for us to talk about. But that being said, I have said very clearly there are some areas. If we just say the world of trans issues, there are some areas where. I feel quite confident. Like, for example, when it comes to bathrooms, I was just in Spain, beautiful country, terrific seafood. I recommend it to you, Dennis. The bathrooms, the, the bathrooms are just gender neutral. There's a sink there and a bunch of stalls and people cross in the sink to wash their hands. Bro, Pacman doesn't engage. I think that's kind of the issue. Um, I brought this up before. Um, that 
the issue with kind of these mainstream media interviews, this is why I said like, I don't know if I would actually enjoy being mainstream, is he's got 30 minutes to do a conversation. So I imagine both of them probably have like talking points that they want to get through, and that's more or less what they're trying to hit for this interview. There's not going to be much like back or forth. That's why I said if, um, if, I, if I get that interview with Ben Shapiro, doing it on, I'm not trying to show favoritism. I love Jubilee. If Jubilee wants to do it, that'd be great. I, obviously, I'll do it on any platform. But if I could do like a four-hour conversation with Lex, uh, that would be perfect. It would be so as much flack as he got. Dive. I thought JP answered to being asked if he believes in God. That, he acts as though there is a God. It was almost perfect. Wow, Cormac, thanks for gifting ten subs, buddy. That would just be perfect. And then you use the stall you want. Everything's fine. The bathroom issue, I genuinely do not care about. Thanks for even having Robert. Organized the Very refreshing. In the United States. And we're all better for understanding each other's positions. Yeah, I think um, I'll probably talk to him after this video some more. Another example that really just does not seem like an issue to me. People want to be addressed by a different pronoun. I'm going to guess based on what I see. And if someone, if I get it wrong, I'm not insulting anyone. If someone tells me otherwise, I'll kind of just do my best. You know, we can kind of negotiate these things. On some of this stuff, like a talking point I'm hearing a lot is so many trans people who go through gender affirming care regret it. And that's a sign that something is very wrong. When I research it, it seems it's under 1% that express. Did you do any research on your own Burisma stuff or just continuing off of yesterday? So I thought a lot about conspiracy theories and stuff. And I think after watching the new Pearl Harbor, I think after talking to Ryan Dawson, I think after talking to Nick Fuentes, uh, and then after doing a little bit of introspection, I think that, um, oh, and then after all the vaccine stuff and everything, I feel like, um, I think inside of me, uh, there was a fear that if I engage like on other people's grounds with conspiracy stuff that there's going to be a lot of stuff that I can't address or there, it's impossible to overcome most of it or um, yeah, it's just like too deep or too difficult to comprehend and I have to like be careful with how I engage with it. But as I've engaged more and more with stuff, I think I'm I think I'm more confident now in a lot of the, I'll say the mainstream, the lamestream narratives, such that now I feel comfortable where, okay, let's talk about your theory. Show me how you do the research. Let's look and see if these things actually support any of your opinions. And then going from there, I think I was too afraid before. I thought that the conspiracy theories were just way better than they actually were. And I don't think they are. So like, even for what we did yesterday with Rob, like the idea that we're so like, if I, if I could get Rob, and I don't know if Rob will actually do this, but I don't, I don't care. It's good enough for me mentally. If I, can rock, if I can walk Rob back from the opinion that Hunter Biden and Joe Biden are absolutely engaged in criminal behavior, we need prosecutions, we need impeachments, blah, blah, blah. If I can walk him back from that to, okay, I actually don't have any direct evidence for anything, but maybe there's stuff here that's worth investigating. I'm actually totally okay with that. I'm fine. Um, because like, it, it would be dishonest of me to say, you know, like just the fact that Hunter Biden does international business in other countries and his dad is the president, eh, that's kind of weird. Um, if Trump's children did it, I'd be like, eh, that's kind of weird. Um, it's up, it's, it's like a, it's like a red flag. I'd be, um, I'd be like, this is probably something that's worth looking into, right? Cause I could totally, I think it's totally fair to feel a little bit skeeved out from that, but on the flip side, I think it's also good for Rob to say, I have no direct evidence of any crime. I don't even really have, I've got the lightest of circumstantial evidence. A call was made to a person that might've been somebody that shouldn't have been to discuss this, that then might've done something that they shouldn't have done. That's like the best we've got right now. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, yeah, just listening to Rob like walk through and talk through like his little theories and then going from there, I think is fine, yeah regret. And for some of that 1%, it's temporary. So I'm ambiguous about what is the right thing to do in some of these areas. I'm open to hearing from you to the extent that I judge you to be a good faith uh, uh, participant in the conversation. I don't know the answer. With some sports, you know, it, it seems pretty clear that there is an advantage to being biologically male at birth. It seems unfair in those cases to arrange it in a certain way. In other words, it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. So I, I think that I am very open-minded well, on this. Curious, you know? I'm just curious. Uh, it's not even a challenge. Yeah. Name me a sport where, where there is women sports. You've got like maybe long distance running, although I don't think I fully believe that. The only sport that I've seen um, convincingly that women are, I think actually generally outperform men on is I think it's trap shooting, which I have no idea why or what the explanation would be for that at all.
where it doesn't make a difference. Chess? Well, apparently it does, interestingly. Uh, I was just reading that the International Chess Federation, whatever whatever the name of the group is, yeah. uh, uh, did, uh, noted that men did play chess better, generally speaking. By the way, if you're right, and I have I have no agenda here, yeah. then there should not be women's chess. Right. So this chess is an the interesting one because... The very fact that it exists right. suggests that there there is an advantage to separating the sexes. My so understanding that, is, and again, I think we're both trying to learn here. My understanding is the reason that the women's chess- Do we count the, swimming? I think that women's champion from the United States has technically dominated the sport harder than a Phelps did on the male side. Is that for certain types of swimming? I could believe it for distance swimming, maybe? The, the reality is, I, I think there's like two really difficult realities for women's bodies when it comes to sports. One is just that testosterone is just really good. And two is lean, leanness is also really good. Um, being forced to carry extra body fat um, as women's bodies do, and then not producing as much testosterone, it just, it hurts physical, it degrades physical performance so much. It's just so inconvenient in so many different ways. And it's at really competitive levels, it's probably impossible to, um, it's probably impossible to overcome those two unfortunate, like biological realities of, of men and women. On, on mental stuff, I'm not at all convinced um, I'm not at all convinced that things like chess need to remain gender segregated forever. Maybe I put too much stock into the Polgar sisters or whatever. Um, but I feel like I do feel like culture drives really hard divides in terms of the things that men and women engage with. The, I'm resting almost all of that on my observations in music where the instruments that men and women play are night and day different, right? Women don't play in rock bands. And it, it's, it's so, the contrast is so stark that it almost seems a foregone conclusion that women just can't play guitar, women just can't play drums. But then when you hop over to the orchestral world and you see women playing some of the best, God, f what's the name of that one? Um, like when you see like women like this, and she's not like, I, I mean, I'm not gonna say she's not uncommon. She's probably one of the best piano players in the world, I'm pretty sure. Um, but when you see women like this play piano or play viola or violin or whatever, it's like, if you can play violin or if you can play piano at this level, there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't play guitar. You absolutely could. There's no reason. So I, I, when I look at the difference in instrumentation that are uh, instrumental choices by men and women in society, this seems to be heavily culturally driven. Um, such that, yeah. And, and yeah, and that would be an area where it's Vision like- was originally created. Well, was, that'd be an area where like, if you show me the stats, I'm like, oh, well, biologically men are wired for guitars and women are wired for violins, right? But I mean, like physiologically, we can see it's not, right? There's no reason to think that, yeah. Not enough young girls were participating okay, because- fair enough, Oh, sorry. I was gonna say the only reason why I could believe maybe women could do better distance swimming is because I think fat is buoyant. So maybe for long distance swimming, carrying a little bit more fat would help. But even at that, I'm not sure. I've never looked at the numbers before. I think people on chat are linking stuff, so. Thing is, and again, I think we're both trying to learn here. My understanding is the reason that the women's chess division was originally created was not enough young girls were participating okay, because chess is not gendered segregated. Um, I believe that it's gender segregated in the ways that everything else is where aren't there, um, Aren't there women's divisions? I thought there was a women's ELO or ELO rating. Am I wrong on that? Yeah, most segregations are just making a women's league. It's not hardcore segregating it. Like, I don't know if anything is actually gender segregated. Like, I'm pretty sure women can play in the NFL. They just don't qualify. Women can play in the N uh, NBA, I think. They just don't qualify. Men's league isn't actually a men's league. It's open, yeah. Women's chess ELO are not separate. They just have some exclusive women's tournaments and titles. Are you sure? Am I making that up? I feel like I read somewhere that like somebody was rated this, but like this is like the women's ELO. It's like a different ELO rating. I, I don't know. I just, I thought I read that at one point. I thought there was a separate ELO rating for women. Maybe there's not. I might, I, maybe I just read that incorrectly. Okay. No, there's not. Yeah. ELO is not an acronym. It's not ELO. It's ELO. I remember fighting about this in the, in the Dota and the Starcraft days. Something is squeaking in the background. Your mom is on my bed and she's been going Chess isn't gender hours. segregated except for world championships where there are separate tournaments. Or it's my washer. You choose. Oh, but it's yeah, so it is. And again, I think we're is, both Are we going to do the majority of a Pac-Man Dennis Prager interview? Is it going to be on trans issues? Is that really what I'm about to... Is that what's happening right now? Both trying to learn here. My understanding is the reason that the women's chess division was originally created... Oh, that might be what I'm thinking. Women's ELO is the same as men's. The title for women grandmaster is lower than men grandmaster. That, that might be what I'm thinking, maybe.
participated, was not enough young girls were participating. Okay, because, fair enough. But it's yeah. not a physical sport anyway, so yeah. it's, it's not a sport. No, I we mean, listen, I don't know. Right. So, so that you, all right, no, 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 but you said where it doesn't matter. But if, if it doesn't matter, there would be no reason for women's, uh, women's, whatever it is, track, field, weightlifting, tennis. But apparently there is a difference. A, a male who said he's a female, one in Canada. From yesterday's conversation, it sounded like you put so little value to circumstantial evidence that no matter how much is presented, it will never add up to equal a preponderance of evidence. This is the issue that I have, my dude, and I don't have a snappy one-liner to, to convince you of this, and it's, it's very hard. I don't know how to, like, I, I, like this is just like a, it's like a critical thinking thing, and you either get it or you don't, and I don't have a good way to make you understand. <clears throat> if I walk into a room and there's a, there's a body here, there's a person here, they're holding a knife, and there's a pool of blood. There are so few variables here. From yesterday's conversation, it um, sounded like you put so little value to circumstantial evidence that not matter. Sorry, I just read that one. There's so little variables here that it's very quick and very easy for me to put together a story for, I walk into the room, and I, and I see these people, and I go, oh, this guy stabbed this guy. It's super easy. There's, there's very few variables, very little going on. I can see what happened, right? Um, but as soon as I add another person here, well, now it gets more complicated, right? Now there's just adding one more person. Maybe this guy tried to jump him and he defended him. Maybe he tried to kill him and he took the knife and he killed him instead. Uh, maybe, like Now there's a lot more stuff that could be going on, right? I could add another person and another body. Or I could add Destiny, another person and another weapon. Dave Smith about doing a debate on uh, Maybe if he wants to. I think we're trying to set it up. Um, the problem is, is that what happens in life is sometimes you get these stories. Really, everything in life is like this. When it comes to politics, there are millions and millions and millions and millions of, of different variables. There are thousands of actors involved. There are dozens of politicians, of companies. There are dozens of events. What happens is, is it's like looking at constellations in the sky. If we're looking for a certain story, we can probably draw any picture that we want, right? I can probably say, I see a triangle here. I could probably say, no, actually, I think it's a it's a circle. Um, maybe it's actually not a circle. Maybe it's a pentagram or a star. Pentagram is five. I think penta is five, right? The, the problem is when there are so many variables, we could really put together any story that we want. But the problem is that a human, when you hear somebody weaving a, a narrative on some collection of facts, the narrative is very strong. It sounds strong. It's like deepening the, the synapses. It's deepening the actual carvings in the wood to make it sound like it's the only thing that could have been, right? And so you'll hear some facts, and because you've been given a narrative, now you feel very strongly, like, holy shit, it fits. But in reality, it could just be a thing. A really good example yesterday was, remember when Biden took a picture with those billionaires? Like, this must be evidence of the meeting and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, well, let's just take a step back. Maybe it's just some guys when you're the vice president of the United States, they wanted to take a picture, right? And I find that when it comes to this narrativizing, I don't think it's a real word, but when, you, when, you're, when you're creating these stories out of these collections of facts, you only need a couple facts to fall into this folly of very quickly thinking like, that supports that, and this supports that, and this supports that. And it's like, or maybe there's like literally a dozen explanations for every single thing here. I'm not gonna say that circumstantial evidence is nothing. For instance, a rape kit is circumstantial evidence, right? But circumstantial evidence is just good for a starting point for an investigation. When things look weird, you should investigate and then find out if something is weird. But things looking weird doesn't mean that they're weird. You have to do more homework past that. Not gonna lie, beginning from a brain wipe with Duggan theorist, deep theorist Rob is great, puts them at ease. Feelings are facts, drawing connections, often gets machine gun out by them, walking through it helps. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Canada. GL beginning from a brain wipe with Doug and deep theorists. Rob. Sorry. I don't know why these are so delayed sometimes. And he not only set records in the women's division, and I am saying he because I think he's a fraud. Jesus. Uh, and, a, and, a, and a narcissist for hurting women like this. He Narrativizing is a word? Oh, great. 150 pounds more than the first place woman. Right. You, you'd, I know you don't think that's fair, no. but on your side, the entire LGBTQ movement is unanimous in saying you're transphobic if you think that is wrong. So, I mean, listen, um, a couple of examples. Uh, equestrian, right? I mean, it's physical. You're riding a horse. A lot of it has to do with the horse. If biological men who tend to be heavier want to compete against women, 
It doesn't seem like a major problem. Sailing is physical. You have to dominate the sail as you are being pushed around by wind. Uh, bowling, I believe, is is gender segregated. I don't know that it needs. I learned this in Valheim, and then I talked to another person about this. Did you know that you know how like oh we're sailing with the wind at our backs? Apparently, you sail fastest when you're sailing into the wind. Did you know that? Random fun fact. I guess it's true because in Val because I, I think there's like a there's like a um, would you say not is it a geometric principle for like if the wind is against you and you curve your sail, you actually move way faster than if the wind is at your back. You're kind of just like at the mercy of the. Wait, people think I'm trolling. Wait, am I trolling? Do you sail faster against or with the wind? With the wind blowing from behind and sails perpendicular to the wind, a boat accelerates. The wind speed on the sail is the difference between the vessel's forward speed and the wind. Once the boat reaches the same speed, the wind is impossible to go any faster. By sailing downwind at 135 degrees off the wind, a land sailing craft can sail much faster than the wind. Yeah, so sailing, um, let's see, downwind at 135, would that mean coming against you at 135 to the side or behind you at 135? All I know is that if the wind is directly behind you, you can't, you can't go faster than the wind. But if the wind is coming at an angle, I don't remember if it's in front of you or maybe it's behind you curved, um, that you can sail faster because you can like cut against it somehow. I don't remember exactly how, but. Um, Upwind sail, okay, in straight line speed through the water with the same sails, upwind sailing is faster and downwind sailing feels slow. But I don't, I'm just reading quotes off of the thing, so I'm not sure. Someone said you're fastest at 90 degrees to the wind. Oh. How to sail against the wind, a simple tacking guide. Why is this a steam thing? Oh, this is for Valheim, <laughs> okay. Wasn't this verified on the Veritasium video? This propeller craft was built to settle a physics debate. Oh, this was this is using a different principle. Because oh, I understood this intuitively at one point. I don't know if I do anymore. Why did this move faster than the wind? What its creators claim? I think it, it had to do with the gearing ratio, I think, between the propeller and the wheels. I'm trying to remember why. It can do. Car is powered only by the wind. There is no motor batteries of any kind. The propeller does not spin like a windmill. The wind does not push you to make it turn. Instead, the wheels are geared to the propeller to turn the opposite way, like a fan, so it pushes backwards. This is, um, we did this at one point in time. It was, it was relatively complicated, but once you understood it, it, it's pretty intuitive, but, but okay, sorry. It's to be, I mean, darts is another example. I, don't, I mean, these are just some examples. Right, so wherever it made a difference, you'd be opposed to it. So you are transphobic according to your side. Okay. Please not understand that. Well, but I think the point that I'm trying to make to you is that there are many people on my side that are taking my view and sort of trying to figure out something that is admittedly not completely figured out yet. It seems incorrect oh, to oh, cast it, it, us it's, as... It's figured out in most cases. I mean, it, it, it's, fi it's figured out... Uh, for for race uh, for racing for track Careful. for weightlifting for tennis yeah oh, it, it it it's pretty universally uh, I don't like it and as I said if there's no difference whatsoever it is silly to have men's and women's sports to Fair. begin yeah. with yeah and so you just listed a couple examples I gave you five fine sports is one aspect of this where are you on something like bathrooms for example and bathroom Jesus. usage we're really doing do you it, want huh? like a genitalia check or what are you what are you looking for. I, I think the that only obvious answer to bathroom stuff is you just go into whatever bathroom you look like. Like, it's just that's what trans people do. That's what cis people do. Like, that's it. It's super simple, super easy. A, 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 an elementary school, for example, where a boy says I'm a girl. Yep. And would be exposed in front of the girls as, as I'm glad you explained as it. they are. I thought it case. needed to be worded out since not everyone will value evidence the same way. Glad you explained it. I thought it needed to be worded. Oh, okay. If we're talking circumstantial, sure. Now of college uh, swim uh, meets where the if a guy says he's a girl, he is uh, Leah Thomas exposed his penis to the to the girls on the on the pen. But Dennis, swim. I hate to interrupt. You first said kids in college, they're adults, right? So which are you talking about? Right. Both. 
Oh. So I'll start. I, I, I'm just giving an example of where it does occur. Okay. Uh, With adults. I think I think that here, th your your anatomy should dictate in elementary school which bathroom you go to. In elementary Ideally, school. Okay. By the way, I have no problem. If, if, if when there is a unisex ba a bathroom with one stall, anybody goes in. Yeah, that's uh, uh, I have uh, I, I have on occasion where there is one stall. I have gone into the women's bathroom if I really had to go to a restaurant. Wow. And it was a little a little nothing thing with just one toilet. I sure. So, admit this. And I wouldn't and I recommend it to women to go into the men's because if my table was near the bathroom. So very I, genteel I of you. I'm sorry. No, I said that's it's that's very genteel of you. I, I'm sure well, the women it's not appreciate genteel, it. Genteel, it's just common sense. I, I'm a big believer in common sense. But so elementary honest. school, it's a genitalia. Yes, I hate that phrase. Common sense is so it's a tautology. Like whatever is is like common sense is just shorthand for things I agree with. It's such a stupid. At, your anatomy should dictate which bathroom you go to in elementary school. Yes. Okay, and then in any other scenario, should it also? So, uh, if, if if it involves exposure of your genitalia, it should be dictated by anatomy. If it does not- There's gotta be like a Seinfeld episode where somebody goes to the bathroom, somebody goes to the bathroom in like the women's or men's bathroom and they like, and they go in because it's like, there's nobody there and they really have to go. And then all of a sudden like women start regularly coming in and other guys trapped in the stall. This has to be like a, on a fucking Seinfeld episode or something, is it? There must be. <clears throat> not involve exposure of your genitalia. Look, as I say, it's I say this tongue in cheek, but it's true. If a man exposes himself to, to Gender women- Gender neutral or bathrooms woman, are the worst had, thing to happen to this country. Not because women or whatever, but because they don't have urinals at my school. It's a strict downgrade. I don't want to have to touch a seat someone just shit on. This happened to Curving Your Enthusiasm it's also a handicap song? It's not asked to see it. He's arrested. Mm. But uh, where, where if he says I'm a woman, then she could be arrested if she complains. It, it's a little, it's a little weird what our situation. Why can't decent people just say, look, women are not aching to see most men's penises. Mm. Therefore, if I say I'm a woman, uh, I will not expose myself in front of women, even though I think I'm a woman. Why can't? Why can't someone be that decent? Yeah, I mean, I'll have to, I, I'll tell you, I don't ever see any geni geni any any genitalia in bathrooms in general. You know, like what is? I will say, is it kind of weird? Who makes the bathrooms where you go and they've got the urinals on the wall and there's not even a divider? Why would people do that? Why put us men in that weird situation? Why do that? And then you got people that they have to like stand and angle themselves all weird and shit and like, who's who is in charge of that? Whatever guy was in charge of that, that dude's a pervert. Or he's just an asshole because he knows he's making all of us uncomfortable. Loner box message you. He's crying. He has girls to join. Okay. So does Rob. Man, I got everybody booked today. Okay. Fuck, let's work. Working through this video. I swear to God. Is the that's exposition. Right. I, I, okay. That's yeah. fine. Oh yes, I understand that. So that's not so, a problem so for you. Though. Theoretically, a man says he's a woman and he enters a stall, and and nobody sees anything. Then why would anybody complain? Yeah. Li listen. That sounds Ooh. reasonable to me. That sounds eminently Hello. reasonable. Oh. What you're saying. Oh, look who it is. Isn't that a good time? Um, yeah, if you want to, real quick. Here, I'm dragging in Rob too. You guys can both do this, okay? We can all do this at the same time. I'm just curious. I have no like strong position here, so maybe he has strong thoughts on this too. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, hit me up. Wait, Rob, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, he's got uh, feelings about Israel. I think a few days ago I said that um, I feel like the only solution to Israel-Palestine is. Um, Israel basically just slowly solidifying the hold on the territory they have. Palestinians basically just kind of being ass mad that they're slowly getting kicked out and that more or less the borders that exist now with maybe some exceptions to some parts of the West Bank that people that Israel doesn't care about um, maybe slowly goes back to the Palestinians, but things like the Golan Heights and everything are never changing hands and nobody around the world is going to enforce it and we're just moving in that direction. Um, yeah, that's kind of my position. And then Lonerbox had an issue with that, so 
Yeah. So when I heard you say that, because I rewatched the VOD before I joined in, mm -hmm. and it did sound like you were kind of saying that uh, you were asked what should happen, and I think you described it yourself as like having like a radicalized it's position. Mm -hmm. It felt like when I was um, speaking to you about it in the moment that you'd kind of moved on to this just seems like the most likely thing. Oh, I so was saying, I think the, I was giving that as a counter to you saying it was a ridiculous position, but I do think that's that's probably what should happen. I haven't heard a, heard a good argument for what should happen um, in contrast to that, short of like everybody in the Middle East fucking chills the fuck out. Like if there wasn't such a threat to Jewish people in the Middle East, I, I think I would be like, okay, they need to probably give some of this land back or all of this land back and then kind of like work out some solutions. But yeah, go for it. Yeah, okay, so just to be clear, like the, the reason I called the position ridiculous, or I think the word was <laughs> retarded, but I, yeah, I think wow. the reason I said that was because it was the, it was the should statement, because okay. I don't really know how you could advocate for this position of like, um, which basically necessitates uh, either ethnically cleansing or genociding like millions of people. Uh, does ethnically genocide when or, eth or does genocide or ethnic cleansing, is that necessitated if we're just talking about expulsion or? Or apartheid well, expulsion is or whatever. Cleansing, isn't it? Uh, it, it would be, be a part, I'm yeah. just making sure. When yeah. I hear ethnic cleansing, I think of like killing fields, like murdering and everything. But you mean ethnic cleansing could just be like mass deportation of people, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. What do you mean by genocide? Genocide's like all? when you deliberately kill them, like wipe them out, right? Well, that's so you're saying it would lead to eth ethnic cleansing and genocide? One or the other or, would be necessitated or by or my the position. Other. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's, yeah, so that's the thing I had a problem with, is saying that this is what should happen. Because I think saying that that should happen, that Israel should just um, grab more and more of what they've already occupied, like in the West Bank. To me, I think it's it's a horrible position for the Palestinians to advocate for, but it's also actually, I think, even a little bit self-destructive to Israel because it's a, it's a massive gamble, if, especially if you're like a pro-Israel person, because um, as soon as you start doing that, as soon as you start annexing, realistically, you're not deporting millions of people like uh -huh. anytime soon, uh -huh. and they're going to demand voting rights. And internationally, voting rights is a very difficult thing to argue against. Um, and if they get the voting rights, then um, Israelis will quickly become either a minority or not big enough for like a big majority that the whole Jewish state, like Zionist dream, dies with it. So. Um, that's the big difference. It's the should thing I have a problem with, rather than like. What do you think? A, what do you think should happen? What is like your outline? You like three scenarios above this, or just one? I guess for what you think should happen. I'll give you. I'll yeah. give you two. Go so it. one is um, that we go with the what is still kind of an international consensus that doesn't get enforced, which is uh, stop the expansion of settlements, uh, try and pull back on the ones that at least Israel considers illegal, like mm -hmm. the outposts. Wait, 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 wait. Let me. I want to bring up hmm. maps so that we can. Um, just so I have like a, an eye for all this. Okay, hold on, because I might just, just geographically. Okay, when we talk about um, when we talk about where all the settlements are, are these settlements that are mm -hmm. typically like right outside Jerusalem, like to the east, or are these settlements that are more like to the north or south, like east of Tel Aviv, or where where are like the settlements that people fight over all the time? Can you tell me? They're all scattered throughout the West Bank. It's like Area C. If you look up a map of areas A, B, and C in the West Bank, they're all in Area C, very much. Okay, hold on. You said most of them are in area C? That map is probably not gonna show you area C. Yeah. I'm just trying to fucking Man, this is a what am I looking at? Is this the Gaza Strip, this little white thing here? I'll maybe find you a link. Hang on. Wait, what the fuck is that one? I, I oh shit, let me find you a map. Hang on. How are we getting three dimensional hey. cross sectional analysis maps of I feel like I'm looking at a, a biology class slide. Just Google Area C map and go to images, like the top area fucking C 10 or okay, Area C. Damn, don't be so mean, chill, hold on. Okay, Area I'm C furious. map. Okay, so is it the red thing? No, no, wait, I'm sorry, hold on. Area C is blue delayed. and light blue. East Jerusalem is in red. Yeah. Okay, yeah, wait, the so there are, <laughs> hold on. So there are Israeli settlements all the way out here, all over I the West Bank? I think most of them are in the Western side. Okay. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you can look at, um, if you look up areas, uh, Israel settlements map, yeah, they are, but they go all the way through as well and into the east. Yeah. Some of them are actually near the Jordan River. So, yeah. Yeah, they're kind of all over the shop. This okay. is why gotcha. um, okay, Israel keeping. So, one position that is like maybe the Israeli right wing position, which is just that they take area C, right? Because that's what Israel already controls and they leave uh, A and B to the. Palestinians, that's what gives you the Trump peace plan. You can look at that map as well. It just looks like a kind of 
by where is like, um, uh, I need to see print map. I need to see that would be all I... the white places being oh Palestinian. Okay, that sounds like a clusterfuck. All right. Yeah. How? Yeah. How? Like. Also, can I just get my for my mind on this? Okay. How big is this whole area in comparison to like a state? Like, if I go from the north of the West Bank all the way down to the south of the West Bank, what is like the West Bank? Like, what is the size here? Um, it's because not, I'm, it's I'm a looking bit at this on a map Lebanon. and it looks really big, but then I see down here uh, the scale here is kilometers. Is like all yeah. the way from the north to south? Are we just talking like a few hundred kilometers? It's a bit smaller than Lebanon, so yeah, it takes maybe a oh, not more than two hours to drive gotcha. all the way. Yeah, because I know yeah. exactly how big Lebanon is. I've driven across it so many times. I'm uh, referencing it for myself, you know, just uh, my thought process. <laughs> okay, can you do this in like just terms of like Florida's or Texas's for me? Driving for two or three hours will get you across the whole place. Okay, we'll get you from top to bottom for this. I think so, yeah. Okay, crazy. Not okay. more than two hours, I think. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Okay, that's pretty wild. All right. That's also why, like, a lot of the refugees, even from back in 48, like, there's a whole thing where uh, you get these photographs where they're basically in a refugee camp and they can still see the ruins of their old villages from, like, mm -hmm. across the field. Yeah, gotcha. it's great. It's a, it's a small area. Okay. All right. Hit me. Okay. So hit me up with your thing you were saying. You said the Trump so, one of the uh, Jews keep Area C and the Palestinians are in this, like, leopard print is probably not, not good. Right? Probably not. Yeah, no. Okay. So I'd say um, what's the more... I guess like the American liberal or like center left position would be um, that they pull back on, they stop expanding settlements for one, they pull back on the illegal ones, which are about maybe a hundred of them, and then illegal by Israeli standards, and then they kind of work out like a land swap thing, a settlement on Jerusalem, a settlement on refugees, and then they go with that, which is what like they've come fairly close to in the past. Uh, they're that didn't, this is kind of what was the peace process of the 90s and 2000s. So that's one option. Two okay, states. wait. So say that, repeat that. So Jews pull back from the illegal settlements, which are, you said most of them, or? No, it's like 100 out of 350, I think. Okay. Yeah. The out, like the outpost that Israel considers illegal, yeah. Okay. Where is the, um, um, on this map, what, what, where is the Golan Heights on this map in comparison north. to Jerusalem? Is it directly? See where Janine is on the north? Yeah, it's just north of the West Bank. But north of, there's, there's a bit oh, of okay, Israel, okay. then there's... Golan Heights. Gotcha. Okay. So it's north of Janine. There's the Golan Heights. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, yeah, that's one. Um, I think, I think Israelis are still fairly split. I think there's maybe a bit less than half of them believe mm -hmm. in stopping the settlements. I think half of the parties believe that. Um, mm -hmm. They're all fucked out of power right now. But, um, and, um, as for Palestinians, uh, they used to be mostly in support of that solution. They're a lot more skeptical of it now because of such a how much of a failure it was in the past. But yeah, that's one possible solution mm -hmm. that I think is worth pushing for before the annexation thing. Mm -hmm. The other one. Oh wait, wait, wait! Is, my internet just blipped for a second. Uh, it's coming back. Chill. Okay. Just calm yourself for a microsecond. You can still hear me, right? Mm hmm. But I also see a lot of Fs in your chat. Oh no! Is my kick stream still up? Mm, don't know. Oh, sometimes YouTube is weird. I don't know why I did that. Okay. My kick stream is still up, I think. Weird. Okay. All right. Go. Okay. Also, I'm so sorry. Okay. So repeat that last thing one more time. I was looking at them. I'm getting it. And I have it in my... Okay. So repeat what you said, like, the liberal thing was. Repeat that one thing. I've got it now. Yeah, that's it. Like, it's it's pull back on settlements, okay. uh, negotiate land swaps so Israel can keep the larger settlements in exchange for land uh, elsewhere. Okay. Um Settlement on Jerusalem. Usually mm -hmm. there's something like Palestinians get the Palestinian majority areas, Jews get the Jewish majority areas. Okay. There's some kind of like open city plan um, settlement on refugees. And then that's like the two state solution that um, is mostly popular amongst like center left. Gotcha. Uh, was very Can popular you tell with me Palestinians. When you say pull back on the most. Um pull back on the most illegal sediments or whatever, would this give, so it just, just is totally like a fucking retard opinion, but like, I feel like no plan works unless you have like a whole country that's like connected start to finish. What you just said, would that give you like a decent chunk of Palestinian land or would it still be like split into like three different weird fucking bodies of area? Um, most of the maps I've seen it, like it looks like uh, Palestinians keep like 97% of the West Bank. Like that was a lot of the plans. Oh, from, okay, okay, gotcha. So gotcha. it's quite small. Like the very big settlements, are, there aren't that many of them and they could just connect to Israel, yeah. Okay, because when I look at this- would have to be Gaza and the West Bank. Yeah. Gotcha. When I look at this area C map, are you saying that most of these blue and light blue areas have Jewish settlers in them? Yep. Okay, okay, gotcha, okay. So that you'd be pulling back quite a bit. Is it, just curious, when we talk about Jewish settlers, are they mostly a certain type of Jew? 
like are these like orthodox jews or are they just like hip young jews or like is there like a particular type of jews or a lot of working class jews it's much cheaper to not really work but like it's cheaper to live in settlements so people with families but also the illegal settlements like the mm -hmm. ones that israel considers legal they are there because they are religious nutcases who think it's their fucking homeland uh gotcha. like that's the only reason they're there yeah and so most people and they used to have fucking tents and like portable yeah. boxes and shit. Sorry yeah. to interject the flow of this, but I'm going to back out until you're ready to talk, Destiny. Uh, okay, I don't yeah, want to yeah, be sure. rude. I don't really have anything to add to this. Yeah, so. you're fine. You're fine. I'll message you soon as I know this. Sorry. Okay. okay. No problem. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Man to man. Where were we? Um, you were saying that you think that nuclear genocide is not the way to go, and I was arguing for True. chemical weapons. Okay, gotcha. So, okay. Um... So that's the hip thing is pulling some Jews back from the most illegal settlements, whatever that means, and then um, kind of negotiating out to where like Palestinians would keep some 97% of the West Bank. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. And uh, the other one, um, which I think is what I think I would advocate for if the scenario you're explaining actually happens, if mm -hmm. Israel starts annexing more of the West Bank, which the current government definitely wants to do. It's like mm -hmm. their top priority. Uh, if that happens, then I think you would have to support Palestinians who just want to make it one state with voting rights. Mm -hmm. um, and that's maybe where we would be at an impasse or, or where we would uh, have a disagreement, sorry. Um, the one state solution, you mean? Yeah, if Israel just keeps on annexing so that there's no possibility for a two-state solution, mm -hmm. then Palestinians will switch their uh, advocacy for uh, just the whole thing is one state. Yeah, one state. I, think, I don't think anybody genuinely wants a, well, Palestinians might, but I don't think Israel wants a one-state solution, right? Um, they do, but they want one where Palestinians can't vote. <laughs> that's okay. like the so, yeah, far that's right like, of Israel. Okay, so yeah. the, that's the apartheid solution, right? Yeah. Huh. So... Um, is there value, so outside of um, the Golan Heights, and I think that Sinai shit was given back to Egypt, right? Is there any value mm -hmm. in the West Bank, like, as land? Uh, there's a lot of, like, a lot of economic development happens there. It's like, I think it's still quite fertile soil, and um, mm -hmm. most of the economic activity that's quite important there is in, uh, like, agriculture stuff, I think, is Area C, so. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Huh. So, there's yeah, a question I, you I, asked I'm me. I'm aware that Golan Heights aren't part of the West Bank. I know. I was just curious if, um, yeah. And they, I, technically, yeah, they stole that from Syria, I think, during the Six Day War. So they, they, that wouldn't even be on the table to get back to Palestinians, I imagine. Um, no, although I think Syria story. probably still wants that back. But, um, hmm. okay, sorry. Go ahead. Syria is a bit busy right now. Um, yeah. I, so I think you asked me a question a little while ago uh, about. If we were talking about South Africa, and if let, let's say um, the whole thing, the whole question was whether you would choose apartheid or the white Genocide. South Africans all getting murdered. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't really think that binary really exists. Like, so even if we say like tomorrow, mm -hmm. um, all the white Boer farmers in South Africa just get murdered, let's say that happens, mm -hmm. uh, would would you then say that ending apartheid was a bad decision, the wrong decision? I don't know. It, I think I, if here's the, he, this would be the more direct equivalence. This is what people would be saying, okay? If there was a whole bunch of, I'm gonna just use black and white, we'll make it as inflammatory as possible. There's a whole bunch of black people in South Africa all saying, we're gonna kill all the white people. We're gonna kill all the white people. Give us voting rights so we can kill all the right, white people. And then you end mm -hmm. apartheid, you reintegrate everybody, and then they kill all the white people. And then somebody look at you and you're like, do you think that was a good idea? And you're like, well, yeah, we had to end apartheid. I don't know. I'm not sure what the answer is. Walk me through it. What do you think? Um, a lot of South Africans did say that. Black mm -hmm. South Africans were saying, because that Kill the Boar is an anti-apartheid song. It's from way back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it would depend on the leadership, because the only way South Africa ever ended was going to end apartheid, it wasn't because of just boycotts and sanctions. Between that and ending apartheid, there were negotiations, like bilateral negotiations with Mandela and the ANC and the white South African government. Um, so the leadership of, South Afri of the black South Africans had to convince the white people that they did have a future in South Africa, that there wouldn't be massive repercussions. And the white people were only going to keep those negotiations going if they had assurances that that wouldn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. So that there would be um, property protections. That was one thing that Mandela did. That's why the Boer farmers are not all getting their fucking farms taken away from them. Mm -hmm. uh, 
other basic constitutional protections um, because they're like technically a statistical minority. So that would depend. Obviously, if the Palestinian leadership uh, was saying we want one state so we can throw the Israelis into the sea, Mm -hmm. that would you'd probably advocate against that. But I would imagine um, if they're going to have a leader that needs some level of American backing or international backing, then they're not going to be saying that. Yeah. Because isn't isn't this essentially the arguments that Jews give? And it's not even like uh, that ridiculous. Like people in Iran, I think, right, do want to see Israel fall. They have mm-hmm. an international fuck body, right? The IRGC that is directly involved in trying to murder Jewish people, I believe, um, by sending an international support to people like Hezbollah or Hamas, especially in the Gaza Strip. And for a lot of these people, I think they literally are like death to all Jews. We want to kill all Jews, death to all Jews. So I feel like that's when, when I look at like the conflict in this region, the issue is, is like it's not even really the Palestinians or any of what we're really talking about. It feels like it's all of the other parties around them that have a high vested interest in seeing Israel destroyed. Right. You've got Saddam Hussein yeah. lobbying Scud missiles over during the first Gulf War. You've got, um, yeah, like all these other enemies surrounding them. Yeah. What, what do you think? Yeah. Talk, talk me through it. So Iran has been saying that since 1979. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hamas have been saying that since 87. Neither of these groups were especially popular amongst Palestinians until kind of mid to late 90s. And I think what kept those groups at bay, Mm -hmm. especially Hamas, was the fact that Israel was engaging in negotiations. They had uh, Rabin, who was uh, started the Oslo Accords. There was some kind of like mutual recognition given between Mm -hmm. the Palestinian leaders and Israel. Mm -hmm. There was some kind of like path for peace on the table and the international community seemed to be in support of it, like Clinton and all that. So I think whilst that was there, I think Hamas barely got like 15% of the vote, probably less. It was only after those negotiations failed and then um, Hezbollah managed to kick out Israelis by not negotiating at all, then um, that Hamas just suddenly became the only the So the gambit here, we're basically gambling on the idea that, I don't want to use the word appeasement because that's so loaded, but we're basically saying like, okay, all these people are saying death to Israel, but the only reason they're doing it is because look at, look at, look at Area C, look at how aggressive Israel is in expanding into Palestinian territory, depriving Palestinians of human rights, of essentially running an apartheid state. If Israel would just chill and be nicer to the Palestinians than the drive or the goal of all these uh, Arabs in the area that basically want to kill Palestine, they wouldn't have anywhere near the popularity that they enjoy right now with Palestinians Mm -hmm. is essentially the gamble that we would be asking for. For, which it would be a gamble, but you're saying it'd be a reasonable one. Like, yeah, they'd probably chill a lot. The problem is that everything's a gamble, right? Like annexation is a gamble as well. So uh, well, but there's one, one well, gamble is in favor of human rights, like directly. Sh- well, yeah. it depends on whose human rights we're talking about, really, right? And when you say that one side is a gamble, I'm sure that for Israel, they'd say, okay, well, we're going to go ahead and take the gamble where we have the most agency. And us, our ability to defend ourselves and fight other nations is we're going to gamble on ourselves, our military, our military prowess and our intelligence and our allies, like the United States, rather than gambling that if we give um, these Arabs everything they want, that they're not going to try to destroy us again, basically, is what it sounds like. Okay. Um, I just I'm, don't I'm, think I'm, there's I'm ever not like 100% bonded to this. I'm just giving like the argue, the, the other side. Like, for, like, what would have happened for the Six Day War if Israel would have lost? Like, what would that look like? I, I, I feel like Israel would cease to exist as a state. Do you think? Or what do you think? Uh, probably. Yeah. I don't know that much about Six Day. I mean, Six Day, there's so many fucking alternate narratives on this that I sure. try to avoid that shit. But um, yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, there's, there's okay. There's say there's one possible scenario where that happens. Yeah, where they they lose even the forty eight war and then they just all die. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I I guess the problem is is that like Israel does at least have a position where they do have a very strong military and they have nuclear weapons and they do have a position where they're never going to give up. Uh, let alone everything Palestinians want. I don't think that's ever going to happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, some there's going to have to be concessions on both sides, but they're also never going to give up uh, a situation that's going to result in them all getting like uh, clapped. So whether that's if they give voting rights and they make it like a very federalized system where there's just like one state, but you've got both groups kind of like doing their own thing when it comes to uh, voting for how what kind of societies they want to build and mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Um, but I think 
I don't think it's much of a gamble to say right now, which is why I kind of like to focus on just more immediate stuff, is that like right now it's just like ending the settlements. That's like the first, nothing can happen before that. Like there's no negotiations if settlements keep expanding. Mm -hmm. um, if that stops, that like opens a door and then you sure. can see what happens. When, yeah. yeah, the only scary thing though is it opens lots of doors, some of which are really good for everybody, some of which are good for Palestinians, some of which are good for Israelis potentially, right? Like. Yeah, like that's like if they end the settlements that it's kind of like it feels like um, when conservatives in the United States are like, do we want to ban bump stocks or do red flag laws? Like we would be OK with that, but we're scared that if we give that, we don't know what's next. And I feel like that's probably the concern for Israel that like, well, if we stop the settlements, we start pulling back. Like what's next for negotiations, I guess. Yeah, but is that like so what's uh, if that if they just focus on that one move, like just stopping expanding settlements, which. As far as the international community, that's like the consensus. They should do. That. They should stop that. Sure. If they do that, what's like the worst thing that happens like right after that in response? Well, I mean, if you're not winning, you're losing. Uh, I mean, my guess would be is if they stop expanding on settlements, if they start to lose any, or if they slowly um, pull back from the expansive point and now they're stationary, then the next thing that people are going to fight for is going to be to pull back from some settlements, right? Uh, I don't think anyone's realistically except expecting the bigger ones to go away. Mm -hmm. um, sure. But again, it's like I, it's like anything that happens seems to it's going to have to be um, as part of like a negotiated process. So mm -hmm. I feel like if they can offer like the like a it's usually like one to one land swaps in exchange for pulling back from settlements, which has been accepted in the past. So I don't think it's going to be the case that they're going to expect fa like half a million settlers to leave the West Bank. Hmm. Especially uh, also, I don't think Israel's ever conceding to settlers leaving because after what happened in Gaza, they're never doing that again. Um, what happened in Gaza that it became militarized and people get bombed from there? Well, they or? got rid of the IDF took 8,000 settlers out mm -hmm. and it was pretty like rough. I think some of those settlers to this day quite a lot of them still don't have alternate housing And it was like 15 20 years ago. So oh, yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Um, Yeah, that's just they're not gonna remove that many at once again mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay Damn well that's I think pretty, maybe uh, Israel Palestine is pretty rough, huh? Yeah um, I think maybe the analogy you're going for sounds more like Rwanda. Um, do you know much about how that whole genocide like took place? Mm, what do I know about Rwanda? The United States was involved in some conflict prior to that, I think in Northern Africa, and we did, we did really poorly. And I think that people blamed that intervention later on on us not intervening at all in Rwanda. That's the only thing I know about Rwanda. I barely know anything about it. Tell me, ex ex yeah, explain. So it's, um, so. It's an example of a historically oppressive group okay. basically becoming the victims. The Tutsis were a minority, but they were also the wealthy uh, like landowning oppressors. They were the monarchy. When uh, the Belgians and the Germans were colonizing Rwanda, they, uh, the Tutsis had positions in the colonial government. Mm -hmm. There was a narrative, a very false narrative put out that Tutsis were actually like uh, more Northern African, so they were like racially superior and shit. So um, yeah, they, they had like every, advantage possible and the thing with uh when the occupation of rwanda ended in the late 50s and early 60s mm -hmm. uh, the result was that hutus made up 80 plus percent of the population and as soon as they had democratic uh, power they mm -hmm. used it to attack uh tutsis like okay. straight away not even in the in the 90s there was already tutsis like fleeing or facing repercussions and all that shit and then obviously in the 90s the hutus did the genocide right mm -hmm. Um, but I think, again, if someone asked you, uh, does that mean that ending colonial rule or bringing like equal rights to in Rwanda, if someone ever said, like, was that a bad decision? I would probably still lean with no. Like what the problem was is that the colonial government that left didn't give a fuck about what happened to Tutsis afterwards. Sure. Um, there weren't any protections put into place. There was no constitution that protected people from being uh, kicked out of their houses and all that stuff. So I feel like when it comes to Israel and Palestine, because there are so many massive international actors involved in it, I think um, it would, even if I think Palestinians get like voting rights and they use those rights to uh, clap Israelis, like I think the point is going to be that um, it won't be the fact that it won't be equality that did that. It'll be like the way it was actioned. Sure. Same with Rwanda or South yeah. Africa. Yeah. And I can understand the abstracted moral argument 
but um, I'm sure you can understand that the on the ground um, feelings are going to be a lot different, right? That like, for instance, if I were to go to a casino and I were to bet my whole life savings on black and I win, mm -hmm. you can tell me all day about how it was a bad bet, but emotionally it's probably not going to feel that way, right? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and I think, I don't know, I th yeah, on the ground, on the ground it's really hard to say because you, you can even take what happens on the ground with Israel and Palestine and even make really optimistic uh claims because despite everything that's happened is like there are still lots of intertwined communities especially along the north of israel and uh, along the northwestern coast where um there are arabs and jews who live side by side with like relative like in relatively peaceful conditions um mm -hmm. and this like kind of happens in jerusalem as well in some parts so um yeah i don't know i just think the, jerusalem the famously known that, for lack of conflict between yeah, Jews and Arabs. Um, oh, what's going on in Al Aqsa today? Yeah, yeah, it's more. Yeah, like that's maybe a less good example. But sure. um, but yeah, I, I know what you mean. Huh? Yeah, and I would still say that. That's why I don't think you could like I could ever take the position that like, we need to keep this group down because, on the off chance that they might fuck us back in the future, mm -hmm. uh, that's like the kind of position I find is that like the most untenable. Hmm. Yeah, I guess I figure it just seems that like because of the unique kind of Jewish history, it seems like if there's any group of people that could make that argument, it would be mm -hmm. Jewish people, right? They have like 15 different holidays where it's like some group of people tried to genocide us and we lived and <laughs> let's eat food. Like it just it feels like because of Jewish history, I could see them in particular being like, well, you know, we're going to go ahead and trust our gut on this one. Not that that necessarily morally justifies it or even empirically justifies it, but... Do you know the, the blood libel baby joke from Middle Eastern Jews? Nope, tell me. It's a Middle Eastern Jewish joke about there's this like village, I think it's Syria or some shit. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh no, a fuck, oh fuck, like a baby's just been murdered. Like they're going to blame us because the, the baby was murdered for, murdered for like some ritual and they're going to blame us. We're fucked. Oh no. And then uh, a few hours later, they come back and it's like, oh shit, no good news. The baby was actually Jewish. Oh. So there's not going to be blood libel repercussions. Yeah, Jesus. they have a very grim sense of humor over there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm just thinking like if someone comes to you and says like, oh, what do you think should happen and all that? I, don't, I feel like a much more reasonable response would just be like, even if it's there's no obvious solution. I feel like you could just say something like, yeah, the settlement expansion should probably stop. Israel should probably try to <laughs> go back to being a bit more of a democracy with the court system um, rather than saying, uh, what what you said on that panel, which is Israel just which continues was, expansions until Palestinians are basically yeah. it's just gone. How many Palestinians are there? Is it a few million? Uh, within Israel, Gaza, and West Bank, it's like six, seven million, and then another seven million in the diaspora. What's the so, population? Diaspora means around the world or just around the Middle East? Um, around the Middle East, around the world, but I think most of them are in the Middle East, like gotcha. vast majority. Yeah. Are um how many Jewish people are there? Israeli. Jewish citizens. Is it a few million? Six, seven million. Six, seven million. Oof, that's uh, rough. I think there are slightly more Palestinians uh, from the river to the sea right now than Israelis. Mm -hmm. They opened them like a couple of years ago because they have a lot. They have a lot of babies over there. It sucks that the numbers don't work out in Israel. Like I feel like if there were five hundred thousand Palestinians, I think you could just say one state solution would be the best, and then figure it out from there. But nah, it's like. It's like probably fifty to forty-eight right now. Yeah, I know. Yeah, the numbers yeah. make it a lot rougher. You know. Hmm. Okay. Well, anything else you want to add to this? Or so Jewish people should probably chill on the West Bank settlements. Ideally, pull back the more controversial ones. I don't know where those are. Um, and then negotiate. They're also scattered. Yeah. Yeah, and then try to negotiate some. I feel like I feel like carving out a real Palestinian country would be good. I don't know. Are there any are there any countries on the map right now that are that look like what Palestine would look like? What empty bits of land? That just like little just... scattered bits of like chicken pox land on a map. Is there any country right now that looks like that? Oh, no, I mean, this is what um, that's what they tried to give in South Africa. It was called Bantustan. Mm -hmm. And obviously the black South Africans were like, fucking kill yourself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Huh. So I don't think so. I guess unless you count islands, island networks. 
So it's ironically, so much pressure for American Jews to go to Israel and preferably find a Jewish slash, slash Israeli wife and settle down there. It's cringe. Yeah, I've heard that. That's always one of the funny things is uh, the difference I hear between, I think I've talked about this on stream before, my Jewish friends and my Nazi friends, is like every time mm. I debate with Nazis, they talk about how much of an exclusive club Judaism is and that it's very, 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 very hard to convert and blah, blah, blah. And then in the United States, bro, when I talk to Jewish people or like quasi Jewish people or half Jewish people, the way that they talk about how aggressively Israel tries to like get people into like birthright shit that we're like, if you're like one quarter of a quarter or if you've got friends, they'll like let you go on these things to try to do like PR for Israel and get people to move down that it feels like Israel's like really aggressively recruiting like anybody that's willing to convert and go down and live there just because obviously having the numbers in the population and the foreign ties, you know, probably makes you look better or, or more legitimate, right? Yeah, meanwhile, a Palestinian who lives in a refugee camp in Lebanon who can still see their old house mm -hmm. is basically, like, not allowed to go back to it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's pretty fucking mental. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, that would be things as well, because I, I guess the, one of the reasons Israel su survives so well in uh, Western politics is because they're considered the only democracy in the Middle East. But, again, mm -hmm. like, that expansionist wing of Israel is gambling with that reputation as well, because they're also very anti-democratic. Yeah. With the um, Supreme Court thing. What was the what is the Supreme Court thing you're referring to specifically? Israeli Supreme Court is like their only checks and balance system, and they basically just got rid of it. Um, they, don't they have the like Court a kiss like Naz or whatever? Don't they have like a parliamentary? Or yeah, yeah, but it's like that's yeah. So that's the parliament, but there's nothing. There's no check and balance outside of that, other than it's not like they have three branches. They just have oh. the Knesset and the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court's basically just been completely defanged. Yeah. Sure. Having one branch would be bad. To be fair, I think don't most countries have like two kind of branches of government. I think the United States is relatively unique with all three, aren't we? Um, I think it's more to do with, uh, depending on how constitutions work, mm -hmm. you can probably get by with uh, that, but... Um, sure. I People didn't say they got like rid the of the Supreme Court. I said they were... Okay, fucking being colloquial, your fucking chat, sorry. Yeah. Uh, People are saying the UK is a parliamentary supremacy. Yeah, but like the, like your presidents and everything, your prime ministers come from within your parliament and shit. And I don't think they have anywhere near as much power as our president of the United States. Um, I'm, you guys are saying bicameral. I'm not talking. First of all, when you say a bicameral system is common, I'm not even sure if that's true because in the UK that system is barely bicameral. Um, and also, I, I, like having a head of state, a president that's elected by the people and wields so much power, I think is relatively unique to the United States. I don't think that. Um, I don't think that I don't know how many other countries do direct elections or the presidents that stand so uh, much in contrast to their parliamentary system. But but I also don't know. I could I could be wrong on that. Maybe other countries don't. I know more about the UK system than others. But yeah, a lot of it, a lot of it just depends on constitutional arrangements and shit like that. But um, yeah, as far as I mean, everyone who's not the Israeli right like absolutely despises what they've done down there. So I'm um, mm -hmm. gonna assume it's pretty bad. Um, but yeah, I think that was. Yeah, I don't know. I think uh, the the reason I try not to go too strongly on any like very particular solution is just because as soon as one step gets made in whatever direction, uh, everything else might change as well, right? Like yeah, that's the thing that sucks about. Change. Yeah, that's why I hate when people do historical counterfactuals. People are like, oh, if Germany would have just done this, or if Russia would have just done this, or if the US would have just done this, it's like if they just do that, then you can literally analyze that one decision and like half a step past, but then every single else, every other variable changes, and then who knows what world we're in next. Um, it's really funny when people try to like plan out like fifteen steps ahead of like a major you know, uh, historically altering decision that somebody makes, you know, so. I think the best way that I heard to look at it was, um, y we spoke a bit more recently about who gets what land and how do you morally decide who deserves what piece of land. Mm -hmm. And you kind of find out very quickly that's kind of impossible, right? Yeah. Like Israelis will say, we get it because of the Israeli kingdom. And then Palestinians will say, well, there's a statute of limitations on refugee rights or uh, being displaced or being indigenous. So mm -hmm. where does that line end? Does it end for Palestinian refugees in 48? Um, so, but a much easier way to look at it rather than land or states or anything like that is just like um, the, for me, like the issue with Palestinians and Israelis is fundamentally like human rights. There's like the right to not live under military occupation. There's the right to vote. There's the right to mm -hmm. um, not be ethnically cleansed. There's the right, like refugee rights to either here's something reparations I'm, or restitution. So, here's yeah. something I'm kind of curious about. How do you, so here's something I have a really hard time with. I have a really hard Most time. Most parliaments with, have a um, house of lords, which is like the Senate. Stop, that is not true. The house of lords in the United Kingdom is nothing like the Senate in the United States. 
Um, no, it's not. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, the United States has a true bicameral legislative body and that both halves have big elections. Both halves wield a, arguably equal power. They have the power to veto, each other, at least when it comes to legislation. The Senate might have a bit more power, but um, the, the House of Lords is, is, is not even close to an analog for the Senate in the United States of America. Um, here's a thing that I have a lot of problems with. How do you, I have a really hard time talking about morals or morality when it comes to other countries and other governments. I feel like things get absurdly complicated very quickly. So like for instance in the United, like a, even like a basic one of, should you be allowed to do the Nazi salute in Germany, right? Like they say mm -hmm. no, as a US citizen, I have a big allegiance to freedom of speech. That's an obvious yes to me. Um, how do you reconcile those moral differences? That's a basic one, but like more complicated ones might be like styles of government. Like I would say in the US, I would say it would be immoral to abolish our Supreme Court or immoral to roll our presidency into the uh, legislative body, the executive and the legislative. But I can't make, how do I make those same moral claims of other governances or countries, especially people of different religions or governing styles? Yeah, go ahead, sorry. I think for, for someone like Germany, you just have to, I feel like there is some kind of like universal morale, or you can just uh, try to take a con what a country is doing, like Germany, and just look at uh, what it means in their own terms. So with mm -hmm. Germany, they it's what's called militant democracy, basically. It's like in democracy, you have to curtail uh, what other people might consider some freedoms to let um, to keep fascism out. Mm -hmm. You can very quickly right now just look at the AFD vote in Germany mm -hmm. and just be like, well, it failed. Look, look what's happening to you guys. Yeah, uh, like your far right party has like more than 30% of the votes in quite a few parts of Germany right now. So, um, well, but like, yeah. is, is that really what you want to go on? Because like, for instance, like, um, like Hitler's party had popular approval and they were able to De my understanding is democratically established the Enabling Act, which essentially became anti-democratic in the measures it was attempting to achieve. But does that make it good or bad? That was a conversation we had right before you joined stream that like, you could, theoretically, you could democratically throw away your democratic principles. Is that anti-democratic in and of itself? Um, you're probably not going to like this answer, but the Enabling Act wasn't, like Germany wasn't a, was already not a democracy by the time the Enabling Act came. I think the first thing that they did that mm -hmm. massively fucked the democratic system in Weimar Republic was two things. One is in 1932 when they abolished the Prussian parliament, which was uh, like the, the Papenku, which basically meant the federal system was done. Um, and that was like over... I think it was almost 50% of the population that that made up. So yeah, that was like the big thing there. And also before that, they had a, do you know what Article 48 was? Um, that was only counter Article 47, right? Yeah, yeah. Article 48 allowed the president to declare a state of emergency in Germany in times of national danger and to rule as a dictator for short periods of time. Oh, so this is literally the, um, <laughs> I feel like I've seen this quote like in 50 different movies where they're like, did you know that in times of great peril outside the gates of Rome, they would declare one man to fight or to rule the city and blah, blah, blah. Right. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah they're like, like that's the, that that's the motherfucker that like everyone that historians tend to agree was like the, the self-destruct button of Germany mm -hmm. was Article 48. But and like, that was misused by in the 1920s by so by like by social democrats so, sure yeah, um, but then how do you also wait real quick are you an american i keep forgetting this i feel like you're in scotland or some shit oh okay yeah. okay wait so you're not american you're not in america or anything right no no okay you have a guitar though and everything right yeah okay. american instrument yeah That's weird and you're in scotland um crazy no um, but huh? so like, for instance, in the United States, uh, sorry, half of what I say is sarcastic. So like in the United States, for instance, our president has wide deference to declare national states of emergency to get things done. So um, Pisco was arguing the other day, for instance, that the president ought to be able to declare because of another bill that was passed a long time ago, a national state of emergency in order to forgive, I think, student loan debt. Or Donald Trump declared a national state of emergency to ban seven Muslim majority countries from immigrating to the United States. And Donald Trump declared a state of emergency to send the military down to assist with like building his immigration wall. So like arguably these are democratic measures because they're part of your constitution or the democratic that held, but then they can be used in like anti-democratic ways. So what is like, yeah, um, sorry, yeah, yeah, talk, go ahead. I, I think there are probably just some 
I don't know. It just feels like when it comes to different countries or different democracies uh -huh. that there are gray areas where we think like there are certain measures or certain things that are technically democratic, but also not very that leaders are allowed to do. Uh -huh. But then there are some other ones that I think over history we've learned are a lot more non-negotiable. Like I don't think any state in the any de democracy in the world right now would reasonably bring back an Article 48, which means they can suppress like basically everything in the name of emergency. Interesting. So, because okay. we also, yeah. even in the United States, where I, it seems to be that the United States is one of the freest countries in the world when it comes to freedom of speech. Now, mm -hmm. maybe whistleblowers, blah, 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 but in terms of just like what's on our books, what our courts defend. However, my understanding is during World War II, we literally had like an office of censorship. And we literally didn't let news stations report on, say, like the weather during baseball games and stuff like that, that we were actively censoring um, parts of the news or things that people were, were saying. Um, so like, are, are these are these anti-democratic measures that shouldn't exist or? Yeah, I'm just asking, I don't have strong feelings here, so yeah, I'm just curious, yeah. I actually have, I, hmm, I don't know how I can explain it like ethically, but it just seems to be the case that m most countries have done this and been fine when it comes to war situations, this is kind of like when people were saying that Ukrainians should hold general elections because America did it in the Civil War, right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, hey. or that like Winston Churchill shouldn't have banned um, fascist newspapers in, second, in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Or for but, Ukraine, like cutting out some of the Russian uh, language media or whatever, stuff like that, right? Yeah, but I, I, I think it's fairly basic social contract to say that when a war happens, a couple of freedoms maybe need to go for a bit. Um, yeah, but then you run into weird spots where in the United States, we've, um, especially with Iraq and Afghanistan, we were arguably at war for what, like 23 years? Yeah. Yeah. And then it depends on the kind of war, because uh -huh. I think the civil war argument was that the, they, they still had the capacity to have elections during the civil war in America, mm -hmm. whereas Ukraine, all the polling stations will just get bombed. Sure. So it's like, um, uh, hi, what's up, buddy? Can yeah. you guys hear me? Yeah. Hi. Oh, hi. Hello. Uh, hello, Loaderbox, my favorite lefty. And, oh. you know, Steven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hello. Yeah. So I wanted to ask a little question. Sorry to interrupt you guys. Uh, I've been sent a weird little clip where you were talking on the panel with like a bunch of uh, ladies, I think. And uh, Loaderbox appeared to talk with you about like Pal Palestine. And you said like this thing that basically Russia should uh, kind of has Crimea because Oh. might makes right argument and people showed it to me and i was like doesn't sound like what steven would say so i wanted to I think ask that, like, like yeah I, I think that the way that world politics plays out as much as we talk about morality or foreign policy or whatever that at the end of the day it kind of seems like whoever has the the military and influence to assert whatever they assert that that essentially becomes the rules of whatever land there is um so for instance like we can say that the invasion of crimea was unethical but the reality is is russia has essentially held crimea unopposed for almost a decade now um yeah and oh that's it that was the only statement i, I was mean making, right Ah, I see. But but it's still like illegal in terms of like international law because it was recognized as Ukraine after, mm -hmm. you know, 91st, 1991st, yeah, uh, but when law we get systems, independence. Yeah, but legality only matters insofar as you can adjudicate and then enforce action based on the legality, right? So arguably, this is one of the biggest complaints well, about the United yeah. States is that the United States might commit actions that some people would say, well, isn't this illegal? But then the question is, okay, well, what court is going to hear it? And then how are we going to enforce whatever... Ah, um, I see. So you're basically we're making the argument like it's just how shit works. Basically, yeah, basically. was the argument. So this is why not it's that important it, not that for it's things like moral. yeah, like for NATO to exist or for the United States to intervene is because at the end of the day, whoever's got the bigger stick is essentially the one that's enforcing what happens around the yeah, world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's mm -hmm. how it works. I don't know why people are then commenting that it's a awful some sort of comment you made because mm -hmm. you know that's how it works but uh basically they were saying they're like a, a hypocrite i guess because they said oh you like support ukraine and uh, like i'll fight for you know to preserve our like state and you know everything but you say like that palestine uh should just get over it because palestinians i guess uh, because they're like the weaker par party compared to israel well and, i don't know if uh, i would ever say i'm talking from the perspective of israel but like i don't know if i would ever say like palestinians ought to just get over it like 
like I can understand why they would fight. Like I don't know if I would necessarily condemn Palestinians for fighting mm. against Israel to hold on to their land, right? But I, I mean, I think you can probably have conflicts where um, this is, and this is kind of goes into what I was saying earlier, Loner Box, in terms of like who's right or wrong. When you get to like these intergovernmental or inter-country fights, um, I can see there being arguably justifications on both sides to fight. Um, which gets into a weird world because it's nice to be able to say who's right or wrong, but I can, yeah, yeah, I can see there being, like, I can understand Israel's perceived threat to their existence, to Jewish people's existence, and I can just understand Palestinians saying, like, oh, okay, well, since the 40s, you guys were basically plopped here against our will, and now you've been fucking us the whole time, so fuck you. Mm. Like, I can see arguments on, on justifying both sides to fight each other, yeah. Also, if I'm not wrong, that uh, Palestine was not like internationally recognized in terms of like borders or like as a country, I, I presume, right? It's not like uh, uh, Ukraine was in 1901st when, you know, the borders were and the territories were, you know, distributed and everyone agreed to it, including Russia. So it's not exactly the same, I think, in that regard as well. Um, maybe. After World War I, I mean, was there a big land cut out for... for um for uh, Palestine that was more or less recognized there was by the everybody? UN. There was uh -huh. the UN partition in 47, where Palestine was uh -huh. a lot bigger than it is now. And yeah. then after 67, they partitioned, they, the UN agreed on those borders. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the current borders are like the West Bank I feel like there have been agreed, there have been agreed borders for Palestine. They've just slowly gotten cut up over time. But even when we talk about agreed borders, like for instance, after, I think it was after the dissolution of the Ottoman Empire, Turkey had borders that were recognized by, it wasn't the UN at that point, right? It was whatever came before that. Yeah. Um, and and then Turkey was like, no, f you. And then they had a big rebellion and they fought. And then they got their country like, OK, these are our borders now um, after they uh, yeah. had their big revolution for that. So, yeah, the League of Nations, maybe. Yeah. After like World War One, there was like this principle of like ethnic majority, basically. So mm -hmm. like territories go to the to the parts that are, you know, in Ukraine, there was like a lot of Polish people, for example, in parts of the Western uh, Western parts of the country. So Galicina, things like that, for example, Lviv, which is like the mass the biggest like the the most uh, important city in the west uh, it used to be like majority polish mm -hmm. so in terms like of population that's why it got to poland mm -hmm. not ukraine like uh, but uh, but 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 interestingly enough polish made that claim uh that it is should be polish because uh, the majority there but they also took valin uh, region, which was majority Ukrainian, and the most people spoke Ukrainian. So, uh -huh. so it started like, uh, yeah, we take this bit because it's mostly Polish people, and then oh, we also take this bit because it's uh, you know just just because <laughs> just because we can. So, so yeah, there was that as well. This is also the place where Volin's Volin massacre happened. One of the reasons why. So, yeah, huh. not that it makes it any better, you know killing people, ki sure. killing Polish people. But yeah, but there was like a big tension there because majority was Ukrainian and they felt like, you know, uh, basically quite a lot of like repression there and uh, bad treatment and things like that, which escalated, I guess, in World War II. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, I mean, I wanted to debate, but there's nothing to debate. Sure. <laughs> you made a point and it was kind of correct, mm -hmm. although not pleasant. Yeah.